Super pleasure that you're here again. In the last two lectures, uh, we were talking about two dimensions in which to understand our current urban systems. We looked at time, going back to the origins of urbanity and ending up in today's world. And we then looked at space from the street patterns of London to the globally connected planetary urbanization which we have today. In this new lecture, the third one, which are really talking about deep urbanism as a hypothesis, we will look at a third dimension, which is the dimension of our own minds, our individual minds and our collective minds. And this really will be a kind of a matrix-like experience. I will take you to Alice's rabbit hole and show you, in fact, how far it goes. This is what we looked at last time. The origin of urbanity at a moment when the infrastructures and institutions, the spaces and stories were first implemented, which made us into a settled species able to live complex collective lives in the urban system which we have today. We also argued that this very first moment of urbanity was then increased in speed, reach, in energy consumption, size and complexity by new technologies, specifically the technologies developed during industrialization, here shown with the image of this railroad station, for example, railroads and factories. And we finally had an even bigger increase of speed, reach, and therefore connectivity into the connectedness which we currently enjoy in our highly digitalized world at where we are still just at the beginning of this new technology now permeating all reaches of the globe and all fields of life. And we said that basically there are three ideas with which we can understand this system. The idea of interaction, where we exchange information and due to that exchange we are able to socially differentiate and with that generate a culture. The second idea is the idea of transaction where we are exchanging goods and matter. We do work which allows us to think in terms of divisions of work, of value chains, markets and economies. And all of this is linked together by relations, relations which allows us to have stable forms of exchange with spaces and narratives which stabilize us in space and time, or more specifically, those infrastructures and institutions which allow us to have complex civilizations. Excuse me, Marcus, I'm sorry to interrupt you. It seems like we don't see the presentation. Uh, yes. Let me share that one second. I mean, you know the images, therefore it's not such a big deal, but I start now to share a screen, which is my mistake, and you will see it in a second. Better? Great, great, thank you so much. So, one second. So, I mean, you know this image, this series, and we ended up here. So we are now, right now, here. Now, in the realm of relation, we already saw uh, last time in the first lecture that here the idea of trust is very important. Because a lot of these relations um, are, of course, physical and real, like roads, oceanic cables through which our Zoom conference is working right now satellites in the sky, 
or uh, railroad systems spanning continents. But of course, relations are very much also based on trust. Trust you have when you dial in 8.30 my time in the morning that I will, will really be here. And the trust you have to dial into this Zoom lecture is based on a technological infrastructure, in our case now a digital infrastructure, but it's also based on an institutional framework, the institutional setting of the Higher School of Economics, which is embedded in a national research um, context, which in turn is embedded in a culture of enlightenment, which in turn is embedded in an urban culture where we, even though we never met face to face, trust each other because we have a common cultural background, which has to do with Judeo-Christian value systems, which has to do with industrialization, which we uh, all uh, went through, uh, through our ancestors in some way. And it even has to do with three billion years of evolution on this planet, where we learned the difference between up and down, left and right, forward and backward. So all of this trust is basically implied in us meeting here today. A trust which is basically a trust into the permanence of the relations which we are currently enjoying. And we saw that last time that this trust is also something which is fragile, has its own fragilities, as we will see later in this lecture in a bit more detail. So this is where we are going down uh, now a bit more precisely into this realm of what's happening between the world out there, the physical world, the world of facts, which we experience as individuals, and through intersubjectivity also experience as collectives, experience as groups, as societies, and finally, most importantly, as people who trust each other in whatever way. Now we have an amazing brain. These are neuron fibers in the human brain. Our brain is special compared to other species in that it has more layers. It has a bigger neocortical area and with that it seems to have a type of connectivity on the one hand and most importantly plasticity on the other hand which allows us to deal very flexibly with new tasks. And one very beautiful way of thinking about the brain, and this is a slightly contested, but to some degree also scientific fact, has been developed by Professor Giacomo Rizzolatti, who is an Italian researcher who studied primates, apes, capricine apes specifically, and realized that something extremely interesting is happening when apes see actions done by other apes or even by people. And he called that mirroring. And you all know that when you talk to a baby who of course doesn't speak yet, but babies already in a very early age, they react to your faces. Something happens when you interact with an infant even before, before speech. You stick out your tongue, the baby might react. You yawn, the baby might react. Uh, you make funny faces, the baby might react. You all know that. What Ritzelotti realized is that in this mirroring action, something happens neurologically which we actually can see in the brain, either through electrodes, which he did first, but also to um, uh, neural imaging, for example, with the uh, functional MRIs and things like that. The basic insight is that those structures 
in the brain which, for example, make a movement or um, prepare speech or feel pain, that those active um, components in your brain are also those components involved in mirroring the action of others. So when you are saying colloquially that you feel somebody else's pain, your mirror, your, your, your brain actually does exactly that. You feel somebody else's pain with those areas in your brain which feel your own pain. When you see a dancer moving, your motor neurons are activated and you feel that person moving in a very real bodily sense. You all know that. Right? You all have this innate feeling. This can be even uh, looked at a bit in a bit more a, a complicated way. For example, you have situations, uh, a context, top left, the context before drinking tea, below the context after drinking tea. You have an action where you grip a cup like you are going to drink tea below you grip a cup as if you were cleaning up. And in the, on the right hand side, you contextualize this action more precisely. So the action in the middle is, is, is ambiguous. You cannot precisely decode what the person is going to do. But as soon as you have the context on the right hand side, or as soon as you have context plus action combined, you're able to derive intention, right? An action in a context is readable for you as intention. So this mirroring can even do more complicated things than just following a dancer's movements or um, anticipating a baby's yawning. And you can see here how in the brain these um, um, moments can really measured in terms of neurological repercussions of for example of for example understanding the context of an action therefore ending up in inten in intention amir neurons have been uh, hyped uh, greatly uh, by people like ramachandran an, um, an uh, US neurobiologist who said that I predict that mirror neurons will do for psychology what DNA did for biology. Um, or he also said with the arrival of humans it has been said the universe has suddenly become conscious of itself. This truly is the greatest mystery of all. But again, um, mirror neurons um, are highly expensive planetary, so for me they are quite a powerful way of thinking about ourselves and the world. They are also, however, also contested, for example, by Gregory Hickok, who wrote The Myth of Mirror Neurons. For me, as a former neurobiologist and now an urbanist, it is still an increasingly powerful way of thinking about the resonance between us and our environments and through the environment, the resonance also between us and other people. So it's a helpful way to think about the world. And we have seen in the last lecture, something I called resonance in space, where you saw all the interactions playing itself out, for example, on those axial depth maps, maps of space syntax. And something similar is also happening when we move through the world between our brain and the context we are moving in. And that then allows us to understand other people. You know, when you look at a dancer dancing, your motor neurons are affected. You feel yourself in some ways making the same moves and you can decode the difficulty of keeping this balance, a balance which is painful even hurts you. You know, you have an empathic feeling towards this dancer that, ouch, this is uh, complicated. 
I would argue this also allows you to think about tool use. So the extension of this mirroring beyond the hand into the hammer allows you to think quite exactly what this hammer can do. It makes you understand the potential this hammer has to affect the world. It makes you read the intentionality both of the person holding the hammer as well as in an abstraction of that, the intentionality, so to speak, of the tool. Right? And we do that a lot, actually, that we humanize tools because we read them through our mirroring system, I would argue. And most importantly, for our context, I would argue, you also read buildings and urban contexts like that. You feel the elevation of this building. It makes you stand up straight and become a symmetrical person with the shoulders back and having a, a very frontal, clear, dignified relationship with this building, right? This building does something with you as a person standing in front of it and looking at it precisely and feeling the building with your mirror neuron system. And now imagine that this feeling you have as an individual is happening to those thousands and thousands of people over these many hundred years standing in front of this building. And this is what cities do to us. They act on us through spaces, through symbolism, through meaning, which you decode symbolically. And with those tools, these cities stabilize us individually, both with our bodies and our narratives, but they also stabilize us collectively in a moment of time, but also through time. So the hypothesis is that, you know, there's mirroring, um, again, between an infant and you, but it's also mirroring in dance and music. There's probably mirroring in language. Poetry might also make you activate your motor neurons, activate your brain parts, which think about stories. I would argue there's mirroring in building shape and expression. There's mirroring in tools and tool use. And we therefore think with our physical environment, not only about our physical environment, we also think with our physical environment as a kind of a prosthetics of our minds. Think back about Ian Hoden's description of Chattel Höyük, how people started to organize their lives in spaces and how these spaces became a mental map of their life currently and, over, and about their lives also through time over many generations. And think that this mental mapping remained constant over long periods of time and therefore was able to, again, stabilize our um, lives, our collective lives with spaces and stories or in extensions with uh, infrastructures and institutions. Oops, one too many, sorry. Uh, Sorry, one second. So this is one important thing to keep in mind. This effect of resonance going beyond the physical of the city into us. Or you could also argue inversely that a city without those resonating human minds acting in it, on it, and with it, these cities would just be abstract, three-dimensional volumes, very much like a canyon or a hill. They would not have any cultural meaning. Only us, as embodied minds, moving through these cities and resonating with them individually and collectively in the here and now, as well as over long 
times even over long distances when you look for example at photographs of cities only then cities become alive and turn into cultural artifacts this is one important idea what i'm going to show you now is a second very important idea which is a theory developed by robin dunbar with his so-called dunbar number on the x-axis of this graph, you see the size of the neocortex relative, relative to the rest of the brain. The neocortex is basically those areas of the brain which are uh, mostly frontally organized. Uh, they are the newer parts of the brain. And there are those parts of the brain where consciousness is said to be located. And all primates have a neocortex and all mammals actually have a neocortex and you see here um, how this neocortex scales you have the monkeys you have apes and you have up on the right you have the humans and on the left hand side on the y-axis you see the average social group size so the amount of individuals in a group and robin Dunbar hypothesized that this is a correlation which is stable. So the bigger your neocortex relative to the rest of your brain, the bigger the group is you can have as a species. So for example, monkeys might live in group sizes of around 30, um, um, or uh, apes, sorry, might live in group size of around uh, 30 individuals. Humans, he argues, can live in a group size of around 150 individuals. The thinking behind this is that keeping a group organized takes effort. It is complicated. And you need to be able to trust all the individuals in a group. The group, by definition, is organized by trust. And generating trust takes time. Apes and monkeys organize trust by grooming, you know, by being together, by touching each other, by establishing trust over time, because you do that repeatedly. And Dunbar also shows that the time spent grooming in, grooming in percentage of your day increases also with group size. So the bigger your neocortex, the more time you spend on social issues, right, on being together, but in turn, the bigger your group size can be. And again, with humans, it's about 150 people. So the argument is that by informal means, when you don't have institutions and do not have infrastructures, you can easily work with around 150 people. You can organize, you can organize them, you can gossip among each other, you, you know which individual you can trust or which other individual you need to keep an eye on and um, you can live quite well like that. However, in order to scale that up, you need other mechanisms. And Dunbar would argue that one of the most important mechanisms is language. The ability to exchange symbols and through that um, have, so to speak, an extremely efficient way of grooming. You know, for example, I'm talking to you now, you met me now for a total of maybe eight hours, um, but already there is trust established purely by me conveying information to you without ever being without ever having been in physical contact so it's an extremely efficient way of generating trust language is an, is an extremely efficient way of generating trust and in organizing social relations interestingly enough these findings of robin dunbar hold true uh, even on social media, for example, like Facebook. Um, what 
Professor Didier Zonet, whom we already met in the first lecture, has shown um, is that if you have more than 150 Facebook friends, they are not friends at all. So even on Facebook, there are around 150 people with which you have fairly regular contact, who you kind of know well. You have a mental map of who they are, what they're doing, um, who their kids are, who their boyfriends and girlfriends are, how their parents are doing. For around 150 people, you can do that. Anything beyond that are just acquaintances. Right? And Sonnet also said that, interestingly enough, that if you now start institutionalizing relationships, there is even more can be said than the Dunbar number. number. You can see that hierarchical organizations scale by in, in, um, in jumps of three. So you have three people who are really, really close friends. Then you have nine people who are kind of um, a, a close group, a kind of a gang which hangs out together, etc., etc. And when you look at, uh, for example, at formal or social organizations like the military, then there these clusters of three, you know, a squad of, for example, so you have three friends which are put together in a squad of around nine soldiers, which is then turned uh, into a platoon of three squads, etc., etc., etc. So then the scaling by three kind of holds true. And also in gaming worlds uh, where teams meet, um, you know, kind of fairly informally and can, of course, organize in whatever way they want to, these scaling relationships also stay fairly constant. Now, this means that uh, there are two insights there. First of all, social relationships have structures and they cannot scale randomly. It is not the same to have three really, really good friends than to have 30 good, really, really good friends. You cannot have 30 really, really good friends. It's just not possible. Which has to do with our biology, our brain, and our history as primates on this planet. Equally, you can organize around 150 people informally without writing down rules, without generating narratives of why these people beyond 150 individuals should trust each other and so on. And all of this means that in order to scale beyond these 150 people, we need tools. We need infrastructures and institutions. And probably what happened in this early temple in Göbekli Tepe was a scaling of group size beyond a tribe of 150 people into more formalized alliances and social systems meet with much larger sizes, which then over time grew more and more complex through this cultural technology which we invented called the city, which allows us to also bring together people who do not know each other. And these people are willing to work together because they're stabilized by stories and spaces by infrastructures and institutions, right? So cities are like catalysts which allows us to have big group sizes and therefore complex societies. This is the second very important idea. Now there's a third important idea which has to do with our prospective brain Something has happened uh, in our brains specifically which allows us to um, think about the past and think about the future, to have memories and stories, but also have plans and see potentials. What has been shown recently is that certain regions in the brain 
were activated differently when the subjects thought about the past and future compared with the present. Notably, brain activity was very similar for thinking about all of the non-present times, so the imagined past, the real past, as well as an imagined future. These processes together, write uh, some scientists, compromise what we have termed the prospective brain, whose primary function is to use past experiences to anticipate future events. So the third important thing about our brain is that we can remember old events informally just in our own brains, formally with stories we tell about these events, and extrapolating from these past experiences and narratives, we can anticipate new experiences and narratives. You all know that. Imagine going on a journey in your car or on your bike. You know physically what it feels like to venture out into the roads of a city with your car. You know it in your bones what that feels like. And you anticipate the pleasure of seeing something new, right? And a more abstract way of thinking about this is even in these powerful mythological narratives in the past, for example, shown to us by Joseph Campbell in his theory of the monomyth, we always have these stories of the hero venturing out into the world, experiencing things, coming back with new knowledge, and therefore have a certain sense of enlightenment. Enlightenment, Whether this is Star Wars, you know, Luke Skywalker becoming a true Jedi Master, or whether it's Ulysses traveling the world and coming back as a mature man, all of these stories are surprisingly similar and they have to do with the fact that we, both formally as well as informally, so with our narratives as well as with our bodies and our experiences, have a sense of the past and with that are able to extrapolate the future. Right? Moses taking his people out of Egypt and bringing him back to the promised land of Israel. Um, all of these stories are stories um, which we tell each other and which give us a sense of how to manage the future. Right? There is a very mythical portion of this, but there is also a very daily portion of this. You know exactly what it feels like to leave your house and go shopping. You feel it in your bones and you can anticipate that trip, taking enough money you can pay and having a shopping list in your mind because you know what it means to make dinner this evening. So this is the third very important idea that we can think about the past and we can plan the future. Now, there's an extremely interesting book by Yuval Harari whom some of you might know, uh, a book called Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. What you need to know is that humans are in fact a, a kind of very specific species, let's say. And something happened around 60,000 years ago uh, in Africa uh, right here and probably at that moment there were a couple of catastrophic events for example a big volcano explosion the Tonga volcano and some other things which led to a small group of humans the thinking is it might have been a group which could have been as small as 500 people which ventured over the Red Sea into the Arab Peninsula and then started traveling the world. And somehow this group here, other than other groups, 
must have had already a fairly refined symbolic culture. They must have talked to each other in some way. We know that because they have ritualized artifacts, for example, in the way they bury their dead, um, in the way they deal with um, tool use and how they pass on the knowledge of tools from one generation to the next. Through archaeological artifacts like that, we can infer that this group of people probably had the ability to talk and therefore an ability to take this informal way of thinking about the past and the future and turn it into a formal way of talking about the past of the future. Imagine that there was some individual 65,000 years before today standing at the Red Sea, a big expanse of water, and telling these 500 individuals, we can make it. Crossing the sea and then venturing into the unknown, but not being alone because they were able to share stories and envision the future. Now, 70,000 years ago, there were about 1 million human individuals of different species, which all were ecologically very unimportant. Today, there's only one hominoid spe species which dominates the globe. So, what this group of hominids, enabled by language, by culture, and by the ability to envision the future together, to plan, and therefore to cooperate in ways which was unprecedented for any species before, whether human or other, what they did is basically they eradicated any other human species, hum humanoid species uh, on the planet, you know, from um, uh, specifically then also uh, the Homo neanderthalensis and others, uh, in partly also assimilated these former human species. We find some genetic material also of other hominoid species in our genetic material today. And turn that, you know, a bit brutally also, this is the argument of Yuval Harari, into an absolute success story. So today globally, we have around 300 million tons of humans, 700 million tons of farm animals versus around 40 to 100 million of wild large animals, both terrestrial and aquatic. Thus, as this humanoid species not only grew in numbers in immense ways, it also enforced other biological species to serve it to a gigantic extent. So this is not a perfectly trustworthy diagram, but it shows, it gives you an idea where you have here, this little squares are, is the weight in terms of biomass, so to speak, of all humans currently alive. You have here cattle in terms of tons. Uh, you have pigs, goats, sheep, horses. And then in green, you have the wild animals. Elephants, for example, whales, and uh, other species which are not entangled with our own species. Right? So something happened 60,000 years ago, making us able to dominate the rest of the hominoid species and start dominating the world. 8,000 years ago, something happened which allowed us to become entangled both with uh, the flora, as well as with the fauna, so the, 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 the animals, entangled in a way where a lot of the biomass on today's planet is currently subservient to this one species. So Yuval Harari goes on uh, saying the original affluent society, the agricultural revolution was a trap, 
He thought from an evolutionary point of view, it is better to keep more people alive under worse conditions, right? So he thinks uh, this entanglement has not only been positive, you know, the fall uh, from grace or the, the expulsion from paradise where Cain had to start uh, to um, um, really toil the land in order to feed his family was also not only fun, right? But evolutionary speaking, of course, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because we were able to keep more of the gene pool in um, circulation and more of the human biomass alive. But he also says the plan was to work harder to achieve a better life, but this maneuvered mankind into a luxury trap. And of course, the luxury trap is a bit what we have today. And humanity's search for an easier life released immense forces of change that transformed the world in ways nobody envisioned or wanted. So something happened in Göbekli Tepe. And we are now at the cusp of a change in a very material, material sense, which started at that moment. Finally, he says, then this whole thing was accelerated uh, with the scientific revolution. The last 500 years have witnessed a, a phenomenal and unprecedented growth in human power. In the year 1500, there were about 500 million Homo sapiens in the entire world. Today, there are 7 billion. The total value of goods and services produced by humankind in the year 1500 is estimated at 250 billion in today's dollars. Nowadays, the value of a year of human production is close to 60 trillion. In 1500, humanity consumed about 13 trillion calories of energy per day. Today, we consume 1,500 trillion calories a day. Right. So this scaling, which we have seen now a couple of times, in an urbanistic sense, in a spatial sense, you can look at, of course, also in this almost biological sense, where our spe species, through a series of steps of changes, allowed us to scale beyond the limitations of biology and enter into the benefits, but also into the traps of culture. And now we will look at this culture a bit more precisely. First, starting with interaction on the left. Interaction, of course, is studied by sociology, a discipline that has been developed since the mid 19th century in response to the French Revolution, so the, the change of our value systems and ideals with the work by Comte in France. In response also to industrializations where people started to needed to start to make sense of what the hell was happening with our societies, which did function all of a sudden so different than before. Right, kind of village and families were replaced by um, worker relations and large cities with the work of Weber and Dorkheim, for example, and of course also in response to capitalism with the work of Marx. So the following authors and concepts are helpful for an understanding of interaction uh, in an urban context. Um, one set of thinking is very interesting, which takes what we have seen earlier as this idea of mirroring, mirroring in the relation between people, in the relation between people and tools, and people and spaces, even cities and buildings. So they, symbolic interactionism takes this mirroring idea and turns it into a more formal, slightly more aggregated, abstracted idea of interacting by symbols. Symbolic interactionism has been created, intellectually speaking, by George Herbert Mead, he himself actually wrote very little, he only gave lectures. But then Herbert Bloomer, a student of his, um, formalized that in a book. What Church Herbert Mead was saying is that individuals create a sense of self 
by the interaction with others. Society is the sum of all of these interactions. Right? Alone, you don't have a sense of who you are. In a group of 150 people, you are able to informally have a sense of who you are. And in our highly material and technological culture, the sense of self then finally very much has to do with your material surroundings. You know, I see a map on the wall with one person of you, a map of the world. I see a shelf uh, in another person's uh, uh, room. And all of these things generate an identity, right? They generate a you, a sense of self. So Herbert Bloomer wrote down ideas of Church Herbert Mead and set out three basic premises of the perspective. He says that humans act toward things on the basis of the meanings they ascribe to those things, right? To a Neanderthal, the map on your wall would be completely irrelevant. But to you, because you are living in an enlightened, globalized culture, this map is meaningful. And he says, secondly, the meaning of such things is derived from or arises out of the social interaction that one has with others and the society. And again, this is this issue of resonance. This map means something to you, but it might also meaning mean something to a friend which visits you, both in terms of the friend has a relationship with the map, but also this friend reads you and your relationship with this map in a particular way. He reads or she reads you as a person who thinks about the world, a person who is educated, a person who is part of the enlightenment and a person who has dreams, right? So the map becomes a mediation tool for the relationship between two people. The same way as we have seen earlier, the church, the Duomo in Milano, becomes a mediation between two people standing in front of it together or people standing in front of it separated by centuries. These meanings, the third point is, these meanings are handled in and modified through an interpretive process used by the person in dealing with the things he, she encounters. Right? We need to read it in particular ways and this reading is something you learn and this learning is something you pass on to your children, to your students and so on. So the first premise includes everything that a human being may note in the world, including physical objects, actions and concepts. Essentially, individuals behave towards objects and others based on the personal meanings that the individual has already given these items. So you have here the soldier in a war and you have the cross. Again, to any prehistoric person, this would be a nice object but completely incomprehensible. There are layers and layers and layers of culture stabilized by an urban infrastructure over centuries to give this image meaning, both individually as for you now collectively. You can read this image. You can read what is going on in the mind of that person. Imagine how unbelievably amazing that that is, that you can look at this black and white pattern of pixels on your screens, listening to my voice, and you are able to decipher exactly what's going on in that person's mind. Imagine the amazing beauty of that ability. Or more formally, the meaning of such things is derived from or arises out of the social interaction that one has with other humans. Bloomer, following Mead, claimed people interact with each other by interpreting or defining each other's actions instead of merely reacting to each other's actions. Right? When you look at this priest without interpretation, you might think he's hungry. He just has a piece of bread in his hands. Right? without cultural context, you might completely misinterpret everything this image says. 
However, understanding the cultural context of this image, with your bodies looking at these elevated figures, and at the movement this man makes towards something he is frontally to, therefore he seems to think this is important, you see the movements of the people behind him, lower, subservient, but looking at the same direction, so there is a center of attention. Right? So with your body already, you have a reading of this scene. And then there is a cultural layer in this scene. You all know what the interior of a church looks like. And that then activates both your individual memories and through your individual memories, also our collective memories of what these moments are. You smell incense. You hear music and prayer. You think about experiences you had in these types of situations and you can anticipate other experiences you might have and instinctively you set this into a story which is much bigger than yourself. A story which re reaches back specifically here at least to the birth of Christ. And symbolic interactionists describe thinking as an inner conversation. Mead called this an inner dialogue, minding the emphasis and symbols, negotiated meaning and social construction of society brought on attention to the roles people play. We are proactive participants in our environment. Right? You can also decode the image which we have seen before as a form of theater. Right, as a form of role playing. But with these roles, you also navigate the world. You have the role of students, and this gives you a sense of self. It gives you a past and a future. And most importantly, it gives you a narrative. It gives you responsibilities. It gives you meaning. So the human being must be understood as a social person. It is the constant search for social interaction that leads us to do what we do. Instead of focusing on the individual and his or her personality, or on how the society or social situation causes human behavior, symbolic interactionism focuses on the activities that take place between actors. Interaction is the basic unit of study. Individuals are created through interaction. Society, too, is created through social interaction. Remember, we are diving into this point of interaction in our three elements, interaction, transaction, relation. Now, this, of course, starts then, then to be inc increasingly complex. Pierre Bourdieu, for example, was concerned with the dynamics of power in society and especially the diverse and subtle ways in which power is transferred and social order maintained within and across generations. You know, why is that? Why do we believe in these relationships? Currently, we are in a relationship of power. I'm the professor, you're the students. And for some reasons, you are both listening, not revolting, and not immediately questioning my authority, right? Like, why, why is that? It's interesting, right? So Bourdieu extended the idea of capital to categories such as social capital, cultural capital, financial capital, and symbolic capital. And you might remember we talked about that in terms of trust and capital already in the very first lecture. For Bourdieu, each individual occupies a position in a multidimensional social space. He or she is not defined only by a social class membership, but by every single kind of capital he or she can articulate through social relations. That capital includes the value of social networks, which Bourdieu showed could be used to produce or reproduce inequality. So there are positive moments in these social relationships. For example, me activating all of the cultural capital which I accrued over 50 years of my lifetime in order to give you a lecture which is enabled both by the cultural capital and by a very little bit of financial capital of the HSE. Right? 
So, social, so, so this is an important thing to understand is that, that these social relationships now they start to differentiate, become more complex and the ability to make them more complex is because these social relationships are embedded in these spatial and symbolic contexts which allows us to make them increasingly complex, right? They are embedded in the space of a church. They are embedded in the cultural capital of a book you can read, right? Now, the next important person here is Nicholas Luhmann, who studied these social relationships and said that social systems are systems of communication and society is the most encompassing social system. A system is defined by a boundary between itself and its environment, dividing it from an infi infinitely, infinitely complex or colloquially chaotic exterior. The interior of the system it does, is thus a zone of reduced complexity. Communication within a system operates by selecting only a limited amount of all information available outside. Now, what he is saying here, that the connectedness, which is one of our core arguments in terms of urbanity, is something which has to do with this constant interaction, or what he calls here communication. It is, and it is defined by dividing or differentiating between an interior, so being inside these connected systems, for example, being inside this lecture, being inside a city, being inside a nation, or being inside a global society, right? Between an inside and an outside, an exterior. And the exterior simply does not compute. You know, the exterior has no effect on the interior because we don't deal with it. We don't have a system to negotiate about it. And there, of course, we have the big problem that a lot of what we currently externalize in our society is um, the natural world. He also says that each system has a distinctive identity that is constantly reproduced in its communication and depends on what is considered meaningful and what is not. If a system fails to maintain that identity, it ceases to exist as a system and dissolves back into the environment it emerged from. Luhmann called this process of reproduction from elements previously filtered from an over-complex environment autopoiesis. Sounds super complex, but in many ways you know exactly what he's talking about. For example, there's not only the system of urbanites, there's also, for example, the system of academics, right? And in the system of academics, you need to conform to certain rules, rituals, and codes. If you don't conform that to them, you're kicked out, you're not an academic, you cannot progress, you cannot do your PhD, and you're simply invisible. So you need to conform to these rules. On the other hand, if everybody would not conform to the rules of being, of how to be in academia, academia would immediately cease to exist. Right? If nobody would believe in the rituals of the Catholic Church, for some reason, all of a sudden, the Catholic Church would dissolve immediately. It wouldn't exist anymore. Right? Now, what is also embedded in here um, is, of course, the problem of identity politics. You know, Marx freed the workers by giving them a common identity. And a lot of what the left has done is to find ever more granular groups which to emancipate and to whom to give their own identity. That's, that has good consequences, liberation of women, etc. But it also has problematic consequences in that oftentimes people are seen primarily through their identity rather than through their social context and through what they do and what responsibilities they have. But for us, important right now is Luhmann's point that this differentiation and continuous emergence which we have seen in time, 
in the deep time lecture, which we have seen in space, in the deep space lecture. This also happens in social system. The differentiation of subsystems into ever more refined, specific groups. This happens almost automatically. What's behind this all, and this is something you need to remember, is of course the fact that when people believe something in great numbers, so a lot of people believe something, then automatically this becomes true because it has social effects. The people who theorized that were the two Thomases um, in the early 20th century, formulated in 1928. They said, more import most importantly, that if man, so mankind, people, if people define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. Right? So if everybody is scared of a virus, this scare, by definition, is reality. And the big problem in the corona situation right now is what of that scare is real, what of that scare is a social fiction, right? I actually believe it's real, don't misunderstand me. But a lot of the negotiation uh, with people who doubt uh, the corona um, facts is of course, are we now believing in a reality, in a factual reality, or are we believing in a social fiction? So in other words, the interpretation of a situation causes the action. This interpretation is not objective. Actions are affected by subjective perceptions of situations. <clears throat> Whether there even is an objectively correct interpretation is not important for the purposes of helping guide individuals' behavior. If you are a crusader traveling to the Middle East to liberate Jerusalem, it's not so important whether Christianity is real or not. It mobilizes a lot of people and gives them a common collective narrative and enables them to take a material need, so the need to discover and the need to get richer, and turn that into collective action, etc., etc. <clears throat> so the Thomas theorem is extremely important because it allows us to explain trust in money, trust in culture, trust in society, trust in science, and so on and so on. Right? We then can extra extrapolate these um, forms of interactions and understand them in an almost uh, a physical sense with work from by uh, Alex Pentland at the MIT, for example, or of course also we can extrapolate it spatially with works by Peter J. Taylor, um, which we have seen the last two times already in terms of interactions happening over long distances. Right? As a mental map, what you need to keep in mind is that we have a small group of people able to scale their interactions through the use of t tools and symbols, infrastructures and institutions, spaces and narratives over ever bigger sizes of people, over ever bigger distances, in an ever more granularly diversifying and socially differentiating culture. Right? Now the next uh, level is transaction. <clears throat> so transactions are studied by economists on the one hand and by people looking at urban metabolic flows on the other hand. The second topic we will postpone to a later lecture. The following authors and concepts are helpful for an understanding of transaction in an urban context. So of course we already met Jane Jacobs who said that at the core of economy are not nations but cities. Cities are the nuclear reactor also for those physical transactions that generated once markets and innovations, for example, the development of agriculture. Another important person is, of course, Marx. Marx broke with classical thinkers. That was his big, big achievements, who spoke of a single tyrant, so a person, a king, right? And with, he broke also with Montesquieu, who discussed the nature of the single despot, right? The person who 
enslaves everybody else. Marx made the big step to say it's not a person who enslaves us, it's a system who enslaves us. Right? So Marx set out to analyze the despotism of capital and therefore introduced a kind of systems thinking into sociology. For Marx, the possibility that one may give up ownership of one's labor, one's capacity to transform the world, most specifically, is tantamount to being alienated from one's own nature. It is a spiritual loss. Marx describes this loss as a commodity fetishism. Right? So what he says is that originally people produced their own goods, they did their own trades, and with that they reinforced local village and family relationships. And now in this scaling up by industry, um, something is getting lost. People are losing the control over their own productive capabilities. He continues that commodity fetishism provides an example of what Engels called false consciousness, which relates closely to the understanding of ideology. By ide ideology, Marx and Engels meant ideas that reflect the interest of a particular class at a particular time in history, but which contemporary see as universal and eternal, not only half truths but political. Put another way, the control that one class exercises over the means of production includes not only the production of food or manufactured goods, it includes the production of ideas as well. Again, sounds complicated, but, but now you should have the intellectual tools to understand um, um, what this means. Because the organization of society depends on means of production, literally those things like land, natural resources and technology, necessary for the production of material goods and the relations of production, in other words, the social relationships people enter into as they acquire and use the means of production. So imagine, again, going back to the early cities, right, where in Chateauhoyuk, the city was still very egalitarian because each family had a house each our household did its own wheat production and so on. And now you have a, a drive towards social differentiation where work is divided, but with the division of work also roles are divided, symbolic interactionism. With the division of roles also power is attributed in unequal ways, remember Bourdieu. And that gives relationships where not only some people can affect the world more than others, it also means that some people might define the ideas in, the wor in this world more than others. And what Marx did is saying or naming the system we, which we are all caught in, I would today not call it capitalism any, anymore, but simply an urban system which is scaled beyond the comprehension and the control of individuals into something where connectedness is so large that the tools of um, control and the tools of generating narratives about that are um, out of the reach of most people, right? And what it also means, however, that these material change which Marx describes, which happened through industrialization and through the abstraction of value into capital, is of course um, a change which happens frequently, you know, which happens right now through digitalization also. Right, so what I'm trying to tell you is that um, as soon as you understand these urban mechanisms in this holistic sense I'm trying to tell you about, I would argue that these moments of change described by Marx have to do with scaling connectedness by technological means and therefore also inventing new narratives 
for these new worlds and with these narratives also new power structures, power structures which if you think all of this as a continuously emerging system are able to understand because they have inherent dynamics. One inherent dynamic for, for example has to do with depth and depth is um, conceptualized very, very cleverly by an anthropologist called David Graeber. So he argues that the concept of debt and credit historically appeared before money, which itself appeared before barter, barter, the exchange of goods. This is the opposite of the narrative given in standard economics text dating back to Adam Smith. So debt, he argues, is a social construct to reinforce difference. Right? It's, a, it's a narrative. Debt is a narrative, he argues. One of the many, many narratives in the toolbox of the cultural technology uh, which we invented to live together in this big complex societies. Now, when you look at how money developed, then uh, money at the very, very beginning actually had to do with ritual and religious ideas. For example, these coins from Ephesus uh, 600 before Christ probably were votive um, uh, symbols. You know, you got them in a temple and they meant something, but they meant something in a ritual way. Uh, they were a little um, souvenir of, of you visiting this particular temple. And something happened around that time, Graeber tells us, where again in a form of abstraction the idea of debt became abstracted and turned into the idea of money. So he argues that in the Axel Age, Axel Age is the point in time when all the big religions developed, so Christianity, Buddhism, and later on uh, Islam. Uh, then a kind of a military coinage slave complex developed. These were enforced by mercenary armies that looted cities and cut human beings from their social context to work as slaves in Greek, Greece, Rome, and elsewhere. The extreme violence of the period, marked by the rise of great empires in China, India, and the Mediterranean, was in this way connected with the advent of large-scale slavery and the use of coins to pay soldiers. So he argues that coinage, so money as a real thing, as a, as a thing, as, a, as an object, coins, were actually originating as a military technology. And imagine that um, you have, you are a king, um, you have a, a group of soldiers. These soldiers are mercenaries, so you have to pay them in some way. And there are two ways you can do that. Um, you can pay your soldiers by telling them that they are able to steal everything they can from the farmers they are sitting next to. This, however, is not very stable as a way of, of, um, of organizing a society. So you can also then, as a king, tell the soldiers, look, I give you this coin. With this coin, you go to the farmer. You tell the farmer, I want this cow. You give him that coin. This coin, for, of course, for the farmer is completely irrelevant. It's like, what the hell should I do with this piece of metal, right? If you then, however, tell the farmer, well, dear farmer, because the soldier protects you and, and is actually nice to you because he gives you the coin, you need to pay me, the king, with taxes in order so that the soldier protects you and doesn't steal your cow, right? And with that, you start generating a um, market and a society which is not anymore based on trading goods, informally, but to value things formally and therefore, again, you gain the ability to scale, right? Scaling meaning with the abstract relationships of 
military coins and taxes, you're able to scale a relationship beyond a village culture. You're able to scale it into a, a bigger, more urban culture. And the argument of um, Graeber is that this idea of debt was then also um, extended to human beings. The idea being that there is a human being who is not able to pay his dues, either because he has been uh, conquered in a battle and therefore um, both taken from his context and also taken from uh, his freedom, so enslaved. Um, or, on the other hand, it might be a person who has not been able to pay his debt in a very real way. You know, he has so much debt that he has to be um, uh, he has to become enslaved because he cannot pay back his debt. So he has to pay back his debt by human labor. So he comes becomes a slave in his own culture, so to speak. Right. So the argument Graeber makes is that the abstraction of value in terms of the coinage system, which allows you to scale a kind of a military culture, was then also applied to human beings, allowing you to scale human labor by people who have to do what they are told to do because they're quote unquote indebted. So again, this was combined with obligations to pay taxes in currency. The obligation to pay taxes with money required people to engage in monetary transactions, often with very disadvantageous terms of trade. This typically increased debt and slavery. At this time, great religions also spread and the general questions of philosophical inquiry emerged on world history. These included discussions of debt and its relation to ethics. So the argument he's making is that while you had this fairly predatory idea of value and owing value, so debt, the ability to therefore say that there are people who are free and other people who are not free because they're indebted, in order to keep this intact, you need a narrative which tells people why this is like that, right? And this narrative, of course, is the great religions, among other things. And also a questioning, of course, of the system which is emerging uh, with the first big philosophers. Right? So he, again, here again, we have a kind of a cultural package of the ability to, to abstract and scale, abstract value and scale with huge amounts of human labor and at the same time a narrative to explain the difference and a questioning of these narratives through philosophy. All of this again co-evolved. You know, when then Christian slaves started rebelling against the Romans, they did this of course because they had their own narrative a narrative in which they were free, had their own rights. That narrative became increasingly important, um, powerful, because it was a it was a it was um, a, a kind of a fairly unifying narrative because it was very simple. It was more directed towards the sons rather than the fathers. It was became so powerful and popular, in fact, that around 300 after Christ, Constantine the emperor of Rome turned it into the official Roman religion. So here you have um, the system of slaves in Rome, in the Roman Empire. So Graeber, importantly, suggests that economic life originally related to social currencies. Um, social currencies like social capital, cultural capital. These were closely related to routine non-market interactions with a within a community. This created an everyday communism based on mutual expectations and responsibilities among individuals. This type of economy is contrasted with exchange based on formal equality and reciprocity, but not necessarily leading to market relations and hierarchy. The hierarchies in turn tended to institutionalize inequalities in customs and castes. 
A major argument of the book is that the imprecise, informal community building indebtedness of human economies is only replaced by mathematically precise, firmly enforced debts through the introduction of violence, usually state-sponsored violence in some form of military or police. Again, this is the pain of growing a culture beyond the scale of small groups. So cities you can still kind of understand, um, like the Mesopotamian city, as a collective legitimized and organized around this temple to scale that into groups of cities and relationships uh, which required more connectedness because it spanned larger spatial scales. A second major argument of the book is that contrary to standard accounts of the history of money, debt is likely the oldest means of trade with cash and barter transactions being later developments. Debt, the book argues, has typically retained its primacy, with cash and barter usually limited to situations of low trust, involving strangers or those not considered creditworthy. Credit so, I think the argument here is that only in situations where you do not know the other person, cash or barter, so an exchange which is really one-to-one, -one, uh, is necessary. If you know everybody and the trust is high, uh, you don't need that. Because of course Katerina will pay me back in, in two weeks because I know her, I trust her, I don't worry about it. right? But if I do not know her, I want her to pay me immediately. Inversely, in social systems, where we have to deal with a lot of strangers, for example, cities, which are large social systems, cash and the formalization of cash um, is, of course, incredibly important. So this moment of taking debt, you know, the informal debt of me vis-a-vis -vis Katerina, and turning it into a formal debt you know, with coins, for example, um, is one of the incredibly important um, technologies which is at the bottom or at the core of a scaling urban culture, right? So debt needs to be at the basis of an urban culture as this needs to include a lot of people that cannot know each other personally. Debt is something that can be administered by an abstracted bureaucracy. Personal relations cannot. Probably there were then always two classes, one where people knew and trusted each other and had power, and the other one, the anonymous powerless. Each restart of an urban system was also a restart of the religious or ideological narrative accompanying it. So the story, why you had people with power and people who had no power. Right, so I think for you to understand is that the ability to scale from, for, from informal personal relationships to impersonal formal relationships which you need in order to generate the gigantic amounts of connectedness we have today. Along the way there, you needed not only to have infrastructural inventions, like, for example, industry and railroads and Roman roads or navies. You also needed to have narrative inventions, um, structuring social relations beyond the local, narrative inventions which have to do with the formalization of debt and narratives to explain the debt in, way, in ways which are stable. Explanations such as religion, such as capitalism, and that inevitably also leads to moments when these narratives are being questioned. Christian martyrs or revolting workers or the rise of communism, uh, etc. Right? 
So all of this is part of the system uh, we're looking at. So now let's dive into relations a bit more precisely. And relations very much have to do with fairness and narratives of fairness. And these narratives of fairness astonishingly are going back again to very old structures. So this is um, a movie. Do you actually hear the sound? But then, I, then I explain it to you. So this is uh, Franz de Waal, an anthropologist, uh, sorry, a primatologist, and he shows us that sense of morality predates Homo sapiens. The sense of morality also exists in um, monkeys. So not even apes, but monkeys. What you see here is an experiment where mon one, where uh, two monkeys are. Um, doing work, so they are given a stone and they need to give the stone back to the experimenter. So they're doing work, they're doing something for the experimenter. One of the monkeys is paid with sweet, nice grapes, so a lot of sugar. The other monkey is paid with cucumber, which is of course not sweet. Right? So it is blatantly unfair. And we see here what happens when this unfairness plays itself out. Wait, now this is stuck at the worst possible moment. Yeah, so, so exactly the monkey has given back the stone and has been given a cucumber. So now the second monkey does his work and he's given a grape. And the left monkey looks shocked. What happens? He gives the stone, he gets a grape. Eh, fui. This is unfair, you know, really unfair. Very, very unfair. What the hell is going on? Another grape, oh my goodness. The world is mean. You know, again, he's so frustrated. You see the frustration, he gives back the stone. Now, oh my God, again, just a cucumber, what the hell? You know, so I think the, the point of this little video is that like everything which we have seen now, um, even even this um, issue of mor morality, this issue of equality is emergent. It is with us way before Homo sapiens. It is really deep, deep inside us, like the mirroring system. Um, and Fair, who is actually working in Zurich, Fair and Schmidt showed that this disadvantageous inequity aversion, this is what this means. Inequity aversion means we are pissed when we treat it unfairly, inequity aversion, and it's disadvantageous, so it's not good for us, right? We are, we are pissed at unfairness which hurts us, or um, more um, scientifically speaking, disadvantageous inequity aversion manifests itself in humans as the willingness to sacrifice potential gain to block another individual from receiving a superior reward. They argue that this apparently self-destructive response is essential in creating an environment in which bilateral bargaining can thrive. Without inequity aversions, rejection of injustice, stable cooperation would be harder to maintain. So, uh, very simply speaking, you know, you could argue that this one monkey at least gets cucumber. So he should be happy. Like, what the hell? You know, he should be happy. But only in comparison to the other monkey who gets grapes, he gets angry and he throws the cucumber away. And the argument Fair is making is that even so, throwing the cucumber away actually hurts 
the left monkey. He still does it because he's pissed and this sense of pissedness allows you to, over time, make society more fair, right? They even argue that, and then, that rejecting an advantageous offer also sends a social signal. So you could say that if two kids, for example, were doing this task, so giving back the stone, and the kid who gets the grape sees that the other one only gets a cucumber, maybe he feels sorry, and he also throws the grape away and says, hey, I don't like that. This is unfair. Right? Me, who gets the grape, I say this is unfair. This also happens, you all know that. So if you live in a society where ideas of fairness and equality hold a privileged position, then it becomes meaningful to show yourself as embr embracing those ideals, even at personal cost. Those around you might feel that since you are the type of person who believes in equity no matter what, you're valuable to society and worth your respect. From this perspective, both this advantageous inequality and advantageous inequality achieve the same end, making sure you maintain status. Right? So this is a kind of um, a corrective to what we have seen before, the injustice, the unequal distribution of power, and therefore um, the ability to say, hey, this is unfair, I revolt against it, be this Christian martyrs or um, communist workers, right? Now, this built-in sense of fairness is actually something extremely important, um, again, inherently in the system we are looking at. Because there is, a, there is an effect in sociology and also an effect in systems, in complex system science, which has to do with proportional growth. We already have seen that earlier. So moments, um, the fact that things which are big grow bigger more easily, and things which are small tend to not get chances. This is true for individuals, it's true for cities, and it's true for any systems in an open system or an open market. So in sociology, this is called the Matthew effect, or accumulated advantage. Matthew, like um, the person in the Bible who um, has been talked about, um, sorry, Matthew, like the evangelist who talks about a person when he says, for unto everyone that hath some shall be given and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken even that which he hath. So the Matthew effect, also called accumulated advantage, is the phenomenon where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. In both its original and typical usage, it is meant metaphorically to refer to issues of fame or status, but it may also be used literally to refer to cumulative advantage of economic capital. The term was first coined by sociologist Robert K. Merton in 1968 and takes its name from a verse in the biblical gospel of Matthew pertaining to Jesus' parable of the talents. Now, um, so it means that if we don't use this corrective of saying, hey, this is unfair, then um, there is a natural propensity for systems where interactions happen quite um, freely, that advantages accumulate. So again, if you have 100 people and you give all of them 10 uh, euros and you let them trade, then at some point a person might have a bit more than the others. And because he has more, he has more power to convince people to give him more, etc., etc. And from a, um, um, an, an equally distributed starting point, you start to have um, an accumulated advantage aggregating with some people. You know, like when you play Monopoly or something. You know that if somebody has a lead in Monopoly, he's almost unbeatable. And the great things about the Monopoly is that you can start again. 
However, um, this starting again in society does not automatically happen. You need to have a narrative for it. This narrative might be the temple in our Sumerian cities, which were centers of redistribution, where you had narratives um, of giving people um, you know, the, 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 the things they need for life. Um, it might also happen in the Jubilees. So there were moments in the past in Egypt, but also in other societies where the kings were forgiving debt, right? They restarted the monopoly game. Um, there is, of course, also um, social welfare in our states, etc., cetera, where, where you have moments of redistribution because we have narratives of fairness which allow us to do that. Um, and these narratives basically revolve around the public good or the common good. Um, I realized that I'm actually fairly long. Uh, Katya, what's the, how much time did we already spend? <laughs> okay, because because I'm actually I'm at actually at the middle of the lecture approximately. So what I propose is that we pause here and have questions, and then we have the second half of deep cognition uh, in the next lecture. Uh, I think the important thing for you to understand is that these kinds of things, um, so those infrastructures and institutions like, for example, a temple, have both to do with scaling up our collective relations in a way which transcends our biological and social capabilities. And it also has to do with the insight that social systems need to be stabilized, both by fair economies and by narratives of fairness, how, what, however these narratives function. And these narratives of fairness, they might change substantially between cultures. You know, there are some cultures which are very egalitarian, and there are other cultures, for example, the Empire of Rome, which was very much based on the free human labor of enslaved people. But they all are, in some ways, stable. They change, propagate, and emerge, and, emer uh, and in, in an emergent way, uh, kind of generate uh, new systems and new histories. So this component of our cognition acting on within um, uh, cities is of course uh, incredibly important because only through us, through our collective brains and our collective actions, these cities actually come to life. Or you could also argue that this collected, collective organism, the Homo sapiens, which scaled from these million, one million uh, individuals hundreds of thousands of years ago to these seven billion people today, this scaling up was only possible because we entangled our brain and our social relations with matter and stories in a way which allows us to have these complex emergent societies which we currently live in. And with this, I end uh, for today. Questions?
Exactly. So, you know, I think in my mind, it works the following. Imagine you're an alien scientist floating in a spaceship above planet Earth. And you see a weird thing happening. You see that some spots appear on this Earth. You see that tentacles are stretching out from these spots first in stone with the Romans, then in steel around Chicago. These tentacles start affecting nature, affecting the hinterland. Along these ten tentacles, new nodes are emerging. And these tentacles are reaching deeper and deeper and further and further around this planet. Right? This is what you see. And at the same time, you see that all of a sudden this planet starts to glow at night. You see that the atmospheric composition of gases is changing. And as you see the oc occasional explosions when you look down from your spaceship and so on. Now, what the hell is happening? This cannot be the effect of pure biology. You know, this is something different than a forest growing or an algae blooming or dinosaurs marching across the landscape. Some, something different is happening, right? And the difference is, of course, on the one hand, the ability to plan these tentacles and embed them collectively into the territory. Right, the ability to plan and build. And secondly, it's the ability to operate and keep intact over these distances and over these times, these complex infrastructures. So you can only understand this spatial conquest if at the same time you think about the institutional conquest the narratives um, behind it, which keeps all of this clockwork ticking, so to speak. Right? And all of this is made possible by our episodic brain, prospective uh, brain, so to speak, sorry, where we are able to, to um, generate future plans from past experiences. And it's then in a co-evolving, emergent way, entangling with matter, which both enables, but also stabilizes and represents these ideas which we have um, in, in matter. Right, so I think, I think this, is the, this is this absolutely crazy, amazing realization that in fact we live in the matrix like um, um, neo learned in the movies right we in fact live in the matrix but it's a matrix of our own making 
it's not machine creatures which enslaved us. It is much rather the emergent system which we daily co-create which enslaves us. And this is both a pleasure because it allows us to reach out with our social intentions in much more depth than ever possible. And it's also a danger because we are accustomed to it, we are dependent on it, and we affect our own environment with it. So this is an answer. But I think the, the, the interesting thing is as soon, as soon as you have this third vector in your mental map, you know, as soon as you're able to always think that what you see out there in the city is both a reality but also a convention and you're able to question that convention, that is unbelievably enabling. Right? You can question this invention, this convention, as an artist. You can question this as a philosopher like Marx. But you can also question it as a planner, maybe in more simple ways, where you can think about better ways of doing things. Because in the end, everything is manipulable. Any, everything is changeable. But of course, according to the Thomas theory, it is only changeable when a sufficient amount of people believe in that change. Right? So there is the inertia not only of gravity you have to deal with, there is also the inertia of the collective social system which we are dragging with us, which has amazing moments of power but also amazing moments of stupidity built into it. And um, again, I think these lectures are important for me because the, my intention is to give you a system awareness. And based on this system awareness, at least you can classify facts and make your own decisions. And one of the beauties of dealing with Russia is that system awareness is something people have in Russia a lot more than anywhere else in the world I ever experienced. Because system thinking, on the one hand, thanks to Marx, is embedded in the intellectual world, but also due to political experimentations on, of, in the past and the present, is also visible in daily life in a larger degree than in other societies. So for example, in Switzerland, um, it is easier to think that what you see out in the world in your society is normal, quote unquote, right? In Russia, a lot of things more easily feel not quite so normal. And this feeling of not quite so normal, based both on an intellectual tradition as well as on a political necessity is highly fascinating from a systems thinker point of view. Right? And you can turn this feeling, like uh, Neo was told by Trinity, this feeling that something is wrong, um, you can turn that into great art, into great poetry, into great architecture, or also into activism. You know, you can, it's energy. Uh, you can use it. Thank you for being on this point. I think it's uh, very, very important. And what you have mentioned also, the level of thought is different, I guess, in different countries. And also every time when we do the project, we remember about
about the content, and uh, also the narrative could be generated also differently. So the understanding of the context is, uh, is really important in any, I would say, urban project. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Many thanks. So I will I will tell you more about this in the next lecture. And I think the word context is actually very well chosen. And we have a context of the real real and we have a context of the imagined real. And what you need to understand is both are equally important and both will enable you and both will hurt you in your professional life. So better learn to deal with both of them quickly. And with that, uh, I wish you a wonderful week. And um, yeah, it's an exciting time to be alive. Enjoy it. <laughs>